Hey, so in this video, I'm going to walk you through step by step an actual probate so that you can get an idea of what's involved in a probate. So I'm, I'm Paul Rabelais. I'm an estate planning attorney. I help our clients get and keep their legal affairs in order. And there's a lot written and said about there, out there about, you know, avoiding probate and um, having a living trust to avoid probate and wills versus trusts and, and probate versus no probate and IRAs and other assets don't go through probate. These assets do go through probate, but I find a lot of people don't really understand what it means to say there's a probate or goes through probate. So I'm going to give you a, an overall example and one I'm kind of in the middle of working on right now. Now I'm going to change the names. I was a little reluctant to make this video about an actual probate going through my office right now. Uh, but I'm, I'm changing the names and I kind of feel like uh, and, and everything's going to be in the public record anyway. And even if the participants in this probate knew I was talking about their matter, they'd, they'd be okay with it. Really, really, really nice folks. Okay, so um, let me uh, give you the background here. Um, I'm going to call um, the woman who died. I'm going to call her Teresa. Um, Teresa was what's called the testator. She's the one who wrote the will. I always like to you know use the same first letter, Teresa the testator. And in our example, we're gonna we're gonna say the name of the executor is Ed. Ed the executor. So we had Teresa the testator and Ed the executor. So they called our office. Uh, Teresa had passed away. Ed called the office, uh, needed to set up an appointment. He'd been waiting on getting the death certificates. He got them now. And so uh, Ed and his wife came into the office. They had never been through anything like this before. So of course we encouraged them to, to bring in when they did come in, uh, bring in the will so that we could review that, bring in a list of the assets so that we would know what we're dealing with. And uh, you know, a list of all of the participants that were gonna be involved. So they, they came in and you know, the first thing I did was other than you know, find out if they had any immediate concerns was to, was to review Teresa's last will and testament. So I took a good look at it. It was, I think, um, maybe two or three pages long, but the gist of it was that it named Ed as the executor and um, uh, Teresa left, um, I'm gonna call it $2,000 to each of Teresa's 10 nieces and nephews and then left the balance of her estate to her five nieces and nephews. So. Uh, $2,000, I may not have said this, I don't remember, to the grand nieces and nephews, grand nieces, grand nephews, and then uh, the balance to the, to the five nieces and nephews. So that was the gist of it. It had some other um, provisions in the will that really didn't apply, um, wanting the executor to finish making any pledges she had made to her you know, charities or churches, but that was really irrelevant. There were no outstanding pledges couple of other things like that. So we realized pretty quickly Ed's the executor and uh, $2,000 a piece to the grand nieces, the grand nephews, 10 of them, and everything else to the nieces and nephews, five of them. So what's the next step? Well, I, I, as I reviewed the will and some of this stuff and a lot of this stuff that I'm going to go over with you is very state specific. Every state has probate, but each state has its own you know, probate procedures and probate rules. And so this is all based on the Louisiana probate rules, but I think other states, the, the format's gonna be similar and you're gonna get the gist of it by hearing me as I walk a Louisiana, you know, a testator's estate through the Louisiana probate procedure. So as I reviewed the will, I realized that, that it named Ed as the executor, but it did not allow Ed to act under what's called, the, as, as, as what's called an independent executor. So I know many states have this independent administration. In fact, I'm going to link you to a video right there that talks about independent administration of estates. But quickly, um, since the will didn't authorize Ed to be an independent executor, we want him to be an independent executor because if he's an independent executor, he can take many actions as executor independent of court approval. So if he has to Pay a, pay a bill on behalf of the estate. He doesn't have to get a judge to approve him paying that bill. He can take many actions independent of, of needing court approval. So since the will didn't authorize the uh, Ed to be an independent executor, we had to get his 
uh, you know, his fellow nieces and nephews to sign an agreement allowing Ed to be an independent executor. It's almost more difficult to explain it to everybody than just to get it done. But nonetheless, we had to prepare all of the appropriate agreements and court pleadings that uh, this week will be on their way out to all of those out of state nieces and nephews to get them to sign the appropriate agreement allowing Ed to be an independent executor. All right, all, all that's a mouthful, but we're in the process of doing that right now. So um, a few other issues that were involved, some of which are directly involved in the pro probate and some of which have nothing to do with the probate. So for example, um, Teresa had uh, purchased uh, five savings bonds and on each of the five savings bonds, she had designated POD, payable on death, to, you know, to one of the nieces and nephews. So there were five savings bonds. And so as, as a, as, you know, now that Ed has all of the death certificates, I think he got 12. We can go ahead and send those savings bonds to the niece or nephew who's designated POD along with a death certificate. So they can take that to their bank and and cash that savings bond. So that's really a non-probate matter with the savings bonds. All right, so once we get the agreements back from, out of, from the out-of-state nieces and nephews, then we'll have a, a stack of, of court pleadings and agreements that we'll send to the courthouse in the um, parish where Teresa died. Let's say that's right here in our parish. So we'll actually, one of our lawyers will will physically take it to the courthouse and file it with the clerk of court to, to start this probate, or as we call it in Louisiana, this succession proceeding. So we follow up with the clerk of court, and then really what we do is we just kind of sit around and wait. And we usually wait for about a month or so because there's no timeline that the judge's office is under. And, and what we filed were all of these pleadings where we are along with the original will that was filed with these pleadings and essentially we're asking a judge to declare that the will is valid and we're asking a judge to sign the appropriate court order that Ed is now confirmed as the independent executor. So all that paperwork will, will make its way to a judge's office. The the clerk of court ran, randomly assigns these succession or probate matters you know, to a, a judge. We have no say so as to which judge it will go to. And then the paperwork you know, somehow you know, makes its way up to the judge's office. And I suspect a judge's law clerk who is maybe a recent law school graduate reviews all of these court pleadings to make sure that we did our job you know, the right way and all of that paperwork is ready for the judge's signature. So at some point we just got to wait. And then sometimes we have to call, you know, and say, look, you know, the paperwork's got to be just sitting in your office, please. Could y'all sign it? Everybody's waiting and anxious, but nonetheless, uh, maybe it's a month or so. The judge will sign a couple of different things. The judge will sign an order, um, what's called probating the will, where the judge says, okay, this is a valid will, we've reviewed it, it meets all the formality requirements, and then a judge's office will review all of the court pleadings and all of the agreements that were signed by the nieces and nephews, and a judge will sign an order um, confirming that Ed is the executor. So all that paperwork then makes its way back to the what we call the clerk's office, the clerk of court's office, and the clerk issues what's called letters of independent executorship. And so I'm gonna link you to another video that talks about how the terms of this, you know, banks and financial institution asks for letters testamentary, but that's old school. The new stuff they ought to be asking for is letters of independent executorship. I'll link you to that video right there. Okay, so now what we do is we get a, what's called a, you know, we just apply online. We had Ed sign an application uh, to allow us to get a tax ID number on his behalf. We go online with the IRS, we get the appropriate tax ID number. Now, let me talk a bit about the assets for just a moment. What did Teresa own? 
she owned uh, when we talk about at the investment firms or the brokerage firms which she had accounts at two different brokerage firms and at one account i think i'm getting this right but it really doesn't matter uh, she owned an ira in her name and an individual brokerage account and then at another brokerage firm she owned an individual brokerage account and she had two or three bank accounts but before she died she brought ed to the bank and added Ed as a signer on Teresa's bank accounts. Okay, so the next step is once the judge confirms that Ed is the executor and the clerk of court issues letters of independent executorship and we get the tax ID number on behalf of Teresa's estate, we'll have a packet of information that Ed can then take to the brokerage firms and he will establish estate accounts at the brokerage firms and those accounts will be titled something like Ed as executor of estate of Teresa. Those brokerage accounts prior to Ed doing that, they're frozen. Uh, once uh, the brokerage firm got notice that Teresa had died, by law they were required to freeze those brokerage accounts. And so what this first round of court pleadings does is it it, or, you know, it orders the brokerage firms to allow uh, Ed to, to transact assets that are in her, in her estate. So really, he'll open up estate accounts at each of those two uh, brokerage firms. He'll move, he'll direct the brokerage firms to move Teresa's assets from her frozen brokerage account into the estate account at the brokerage account where those assets will sit there for a little while. In the meantime, um, Teresa had an IRA at one of those brokerage firms and they're already, um, un they're, they're already underway because Teresa had named the five nieces and nephews as 20% each beneficiaries of that IRA. So they're, that's underway. They've, they've gotten death certificates to that brokerage firm. The, um, the five nieces and nephews are in the process of establishing their inherited IRA accounts. Uh, an IRA, as long as there's beneficiaries named, it's, it's not involved in the probate. And uh, over the next, I suspect, maybe the next, maybe two to four weeks, the brokerage firm will divide up Teresa's IRA into the five inherited IRA accounts, 20% each. And uh, we'll talk about the tax consequences to that in a minute. Okay, so because the will said that um, Teresa left $2,000 to each of her 10 grandnieces and grandnephews, the executor's got to take care of that. And I suspect either he'll write checks out of one of these estate accounts at the brokerage firms, or quite frankly, he may just write those checks out of Teresa's bank accounts, which he is a signer on, because since he's a signer on it, the banks didn't freeze the accounts. So he may just write those checks out of, out of that account. Technically, the rules say um, Ed is supposed to move all of Teresa's money um, into an estate account, but you know, practically sometimes uh, the person who has that signature authority, especially if they're the executor, they sometimes just continue operating out of the deceased personal account that they have signature authority on. So those $2,000 checks will be you know, sent to those 10 people all out of state, um, and we'll have to get a receipt that we will prepare all of that um, and we'll have to get them all to sign a receipt acknowledging that they've received their inheritance because I think a judge is going to want to see before he orders the remainder of the assets to be dispersed to the nieces and nephews, he wants to see proof that those 10 specific bequests have been satisfied. So that's some other you know, paperwork that will, kind of court paperwork that we'll prepare and, and see through it. Okay, um, so uh, in the meantime, um, we'll be getting the appropriate lists of all the assets on the date that Teresa died from the brokerage firm because we've got to prepare what the court requires, this detailed descriptive list of assets and liabilities showing everything that Teresa owned on the date that she died and the value of all of those things. So we've got to prepare that inventory or that detailed descriptive list of assets. And then once all the $2,000 checks get sent out to the grandnieces, the grandnephews, and we get those receipts, then um, now we're, we're at a point where we're ready to start the process of kind of finishing up. And we'll do that 
by preparing more court pleadings that the nieces and nephews will send out of state, get them to sign all those court pleadings where, where we'll file those court pleadings at the courthouse, essentially asking a judge, saying something like, okay, judge, here's the deal. Um, we've paid out all of the specific bequests, the $2,000 to the 10, 10 people. Here's the receipts where they acknowledge that they've all received their inheritance. All the estate debts have been paid. Assets are sitting in these estate accounts at brokerage firms. And so judge, please sign the appropriate court orders ordering that the remaining assets be dispersed out to the five nieces and nephews. So we'll file those court pleadings of the courthouse and then we wait. How long we wait can vary, could be weeks, could be months, but um, and as if it gets into months, we keep kind of nudging, hey, courthouse, hey, judge's office, would you please, 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 uh, you know, get to that stuff. And then the judge at some point will sign that order and we'll get that court order to the various brokerage firms. And between the brokerage firm and, and Ed, the executor, they'll see to it that accounts get established for each of the five nieces and nephews at each of the two brokerage firms. And then between Ed and the brokerage firms, they'll divide up um, the assets that are in that or in those estate accounts, you know, into the five new individual brokerage accounts that each of the nieces and nephews have. And, and then what will happen is um, Ed will retain maybe a few, few thousand dollars in an estate account so that if he needs to file a final income tax return and pay for tax preparation fees or pay tax, you know, he doesn't have to go to his to the other nieces and nephews and ask them for money. So he'll hold back maybe five or ten thousand dollars, make sure all that final stuff gets taken care of and then disperse the rest of it to the nieces and nephews. And that will pretty much wrap up the probate. Uh, in this matter, everybody gets along great. Everybody, you know, it, they're just so thankful that um, that they're that they were thought of by their you know aunt or great aunt. It's kind of a bonus to everybody and real real strong, real close family. All right. So whenever we go over the probate, you know, always people ask, you know, are there any tax consequences? So let me tell you about the conversations we had about the tax consequences. I mentioned that Teresa had an IRA. It's going to be divided up five ways. And since Ter Teresa died after December 31st of 2019, the SECURE Act kicks in. And once those funds get into those inherited IRAs for the nieces and nephews, the nieces and nephews will have to take distributions from that inherited IRA uh, at, at any point over the next 10 years. But by, the, by 10 years, it's all got to come out of their inherited IRA and they'll have to report those distributions as ordinary income and, and on their income tax return. Really, all of the other assets, the, the investment account, the bank accounts, all that is, goes falls under that general rule that an inheritance is income tax free. And we did also discuss uh, the capital gains tax consequences because Teresa had some investments that have grown in value since she purchased them many years ago. And because of the step up in basis, all of that appreciation will go untaxed and the nieces and nephews will, you know, the, the basis of those investments that they get put into their individual brokerage account will be the value of those investments on the date that Teresa died. And then of course, there's no federal estate tax because of the, for 2020, $11.58 million estate tax exemption. Okay, so that's kind of your start to finish. A uh, couple of other points worth mentioning. You know, there's so much out there about the, the will or trust, will versus trust, will with probate, trust without probate, which one's better, what should you do? Is there a threshold where if people have more, they do this or less, they do that? So might as well you know, talk about what would have happened if uh, Teresa had created a living trust and said in her trust that when she died, Ed would be the trustee, $2,000 to each of her grand nieces and grand grandnephews, the rest of the trust assets to her five nieces and nephews equally. Well, what, what would have happened is they, they would not have needed me when Teresa died because Ed could have just gone to directly to the financial institutions, the brokerage firms, and, um, and as the successor trustee of Teresa's trust, he could have simply you know, directed the investment firms to divide up the investment, uh, the brokerage account assets five ways among the grand nieces and nephews. And 
Ed would have also had to have made sure that the grandnieces and grandnephews would have each received their $2,000. But really, accounts would not have been frozen. We wouldn't have had to have filed any pleadings at the courthouse. If she would have had a will, it wouldn't have needed to be used because her, her probate assets would have been titled in the name of her trust when she died. So um, if she had had a trust, they, they wouldn't have needed that court and attorney involvement like they require when Teresa had a will and we've got to go through the court process um, to uh, enable those disbursements to be made. Okay, one other real important matter is, and uh, so uh, in, in addition to just um, kind of exactly what a probate is, uh, and look, realize they're all different, and they're all different because will provisions can be different, state law can be different, the parties can all be different in different relationships, the provisions in the will could be very, very different. So this one was about as straightforward as it gets. Um, and so, but every, everyone is different. But I wanted to give you at least one example of exactly what one looks like under the circumstances that I described. So don't assume they're all gonna be, you know, just like what I just addressed. Okay, so, but real important that you do so you don't miss anything, hit the subscribe button, the notification bell, and then to please the YouTube algorithms, make sure you give it a thumbs up. We don't want to disappoint the YouTube algorithms. And uh, then tune in every 10 a.m. Central Morning, Central Time every morning. More estate planning education. We'll see you tomorrow.